of the clan. Of the <laughs> okay. So we're now recording. All right. So uh, back to what we're doing. As I said, we're under no obligation to tell you what happens to an option contract because you're held accountable to know this concept of in the money or an in intrinsic value. So this is an Apple 180 call. And then I tell you at expiration that Apple is 186. <laughs> you should be able to tell me that that contract got exercised. Because again, the market price is up from the strike price. Now you can do a lot of ways to kind of think of that. You could think, well, gee, you know, do I want to buy Apple at 180 when it's at 186? Absolutely. Absolutely. There you go, Courtney. Because Courtney is now recording. So uh, that's one way to do it. You can use that memory aid device, call up, call up. The market price is up. And so when we get into tax consequences, that's going to be phrase dollars is going to be important, right? Because they're going to say several weeks later with Apple at 186, you know, you close out at intrinsic value or several at expiration, whatever the case may be. And then if Apple at expiration is 178, the contract will expire worthless. So let's put that here. If at expiration, the contract has no intrinsic value. Now you asked me earlier, that would be the same thing as saying it's out of the money. So, you know, it's kind of like learning a foreign language. They say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it. So, you know, when you first have your first series seven dream, you know, then you're on track, right? So if the contract has no intrinsic value, the contract will expire worthless. Now, warning, I'm being a jerk. Is that good news or bad news? If I tell you the contract expired worthless. I guess it depends on if you're on the receiving end. Excellent. Thing. Good job. I didn't That's get you. Well, it depends. Can you tell me more? You know, in other words, we're going to, where we're heading is taxes, right? So that's either going to be a taxable gain or a taxable loss. Let's just put that there. This is going to be either, by the way, short term capital gain or loss. We'll do this in just a sec, but you either made money or you lost money. Right. So that, that's that I think is kind of simple kind of thing. If I say, okay, if this thing expires, I'm kind of done. Because it's either a contract I bought and I lost my premium. But we'll look at these with some numbers here in a little bit. But you know, we get got that. Right. Okay. So now traded, let's talk about that. So if you're trading the option, what that means is you're offsetting what you've done. So you either did, whoop, you either did an opening purchase. I get a different color here. Right, because that's how you buy the option. Right, so you did an opening purchase. And then that means uh, the offset for that is going to be two, 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 two. I got to go smaller font here. Uh, test question, you guys tell me, what type of order do we use? What kind of order do we use to eliminate, reduce, or offset a long position? Because remember, the opening purchase is the long position. A closing, closing, closing sale. sale. Closing sale, indeed. By the way, that, that alone is testable. You know, you know, every time I get a chance with an answer set, I always put this as a potential answer set. Now, again, that's either going to be good news or bad news, right? Because when we uh, net the numbers, you either got a gain or you got a what? A loss. A loss. Now, what makes our business a little more challenging is that in our business, you can start by selling. You know, that's kind of unique to our business. You know, most businesses, that's not something you do. Right, but that would be how you would establish the short position. And then remember, how do you get rid of the short position? To very testable, what is the offset? What is the offset? How do you eliminate or reduce a short position? Would it be a closing purchase then? Right on, right on. Say it was good confidence. Say it like you know it. I always get confused with those, so I'm kind of shocked that I even... <laughs> Well, you know, that's why you got to just keep practice drilling and rehearsing because, you know, like I say, it is like a foreign language. You just got to 
you know, you got to be resilient. You got to keep working. So, uh, and this would gonna... never be any other way. It would always be opening purchase, closing sale. Opening yeah, you're, sale, always, you're either going, purchase. remember, right on, Carol. You're either going long okay. or you're going short. Okay. I don't know why this is so complicated. And when you get it, you're like, oh, duh. Well, you know? yeah, but you know what happens with options? The lights go on and they go out again. So, you know, you, <laughs> ah, you, know, you have the aha factor. Ah, I get it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, the, one so. that, the one thing that I struggle with a lot with it is intrinsic. When they well, we're gonna do, do it. it, yeah, we're gonna do it in a minute. So, so again, short term okay. gain or loss. I'm gonna show it to you for, for uh, all of it, but what we're doing right now is just setting up how the questions are going to end. Right? We said it, it, in this game, at the end, the contract mm -hmm. can be traded, the contract can be exercised, or the contract can expire. Now, in terms of exercise, what we're going to need to figure out is what's called our cost basis. And I'm going to show this to you versus sales proceeds. All right. So we're getting ready to play the game. We're getting ready to play the game, right? So what we're talking about is taxation on options. But I kind of hinted that you can't really do taxation on options unless you can actually do other things as well, right? Those other things being, can you, you know, figure out what's going on. So let's uh, put a position on the board. Let's put a position on the board. Uh, let's say that we buy 100 shares of Apple. Well, let's do the option first. Let's just do options first. Uh, let's buy one Apple December 180 call at eight. Okay, so first test question, is that an opening purchase? Is that an opening purchase or is that an opening sale? Opening purchase. That is an opening purchase. So what we're going to do now, again, you can do it any way you want, but, you know, uh, buffet, take what you like, leave what you don't. But I like to, underneath the option contract, kind of get straight at what I'm looking at. What I'm looking at is a choice to buy the stock at the strike price. Because otherwise, you know, what you can do is you can just keep staring at it and going, I don't know. You know, that's not a good thing. So I would like to get pretty good at contract specifications. And then uh, I always believe in doing an initial setup. So we don't even know what the question is, but it doesn't deter us from saying, okay, well, I bet at some point I'm going to probably need a T to figure out what's going on. So we're going to open up a T here. And some people like to use pluses and minuses. Some people like to use debit credit. I like to use dollars out, dollars in, but you know, whatever floats your boat in terms of tracking money. If you can track money and you know contract specifications, you're going to get a hundred on options because there'll be no way to fool you. And as we said, and we were correct, we said that we did an opening purchase here. And again, it's very testable to know opening purchase could have been a purchase is because remember, it could have been more than one contract. So, you know, just in English, what I'm in here is I'm in control of 100 shares of Apple at any time between now and December, very testable when in December, the third Friday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. That's a test question. Angels weep for you if you miss recognition questions like that. When do options expire? There's no analytical prowess to do that. And I said another question, test question you need to know is it opening purchase? They could point blank on the test, say which of the following orders would be used to establish or add to a long position? I mean, that's a test question. And then you better tell me that that would be an opening purchase. Now, again, I like to do things on a per share basis, you know, but again, whatever floats your boat. So I like to do things on a per share basis. And so I'm going to put eight there just, you know, at the end, remember that's $800. And this was 10 contracts. I'm certainly not on 10 contracts. I'm going to put $8,000 in there. You know, you guys sent me, what do you guys send me? A past perfect question. And Kaplan's guilty too. And I think part of what makes it so difficult is they got all these zeros floating around. They got like, you know, thousands of dollars going in and out. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so I believe in doing that on a per share basis. And then when you're all done, Add the zeros. I, I by the way, that's how most of us do it. I don't tell uh I don't tell uh you know uh 
Elon that he's uh, up $5 billion today, today. I say, Elon, Tesla went up five points. He goes, what does that mean to me? I go, we'll figure it out. I probably wouldn't say that to him, but you know, I'm telling him to multiply however many shares of Tesla he's got by the $5. Okay, so very testable. This is what we're talking about. So now we're going to be looking at closing this out. And what are the tax consequences of doing so? Now, before I close this out, you know, we know there's going to be a couple ways they could say this. They could say, uh, buy one, your customer buys one Apple, December 180, call it eight. When Apple's at, who cares? We don't care where Apple's at when we do the trade. And now they say several weeks later, like on time clock questions. Several hmm. weeks later, let's say that Apple is 192. Apple's 192. I just made that up. Just as they would on the test. And I just, you know, give it information. And then what I like to do is I like to put my market price either above or below my strike just to make my analysis a little easier. So then right there you would say it's in the money, right? The contract is in the money. You're mm -hmm. correct. It has 12 points of intrinsic value. Now, the reason that's important is because sometimes on the test, they say you close out at intrinsic value. So if you don't know what intrinsic value is, you don't know how to close it out. That's what yeah. got me when I was taking the test. I, I didn't, because I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know what it was. Yeah, so closing, what we're going to do here is we're going to do a closing sale for intrinsic value. And then again, we said it's very testable. No, the closing sales would be used to eliminate, that alone was a test question, you know, which of the following orders would be used to eliminate or reduce or offset a long position. And you would say a closing sale, right? And so our closing sale is gonna be for how much? If the stock is uh, 192 and it's 180 call and we're closing it out for intrinsic value. In fact, I like to use dollars out, dollars in. So let's put that here. Some people like to use pluses and minuses. Some people like to use, you know, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but what is the intrinsic value of a 180 call with Apple at 192? Well, is it 12? It's 12. Now be careful. I didn't ask you what it's 12. I didn't ask you to tell me it's 12. I said, if you close it out, Oh. 12. What is the gain or loss? That's a different question, right? Or so you be careful or, about whether I'm asking you what is the intrinsic value of a 180 call with a stock at 192, 12 points, or if I'm saying close it out at intrinsic value. Those are different questions. Okay, so now we're on to what we are talking about tax consequences. Wait, I'm sorry. I think that. I lost myself a little bit. So you said yeah. one, 192 is in the money. 12 would be the, the intrinsic value. Okay. Yeah, so let's just go back with test phraseology. Your customer buys one Apple, December 180, call it eight, when Apple's 178. Who cares? We don't care where Apple's at when we do the trick. We care where Apple's at later on. Right? So now we're going to have play what I call a time clock question. First, I'm going to show you several weeks later. Then I'm going to show you at expiration. So in this version, I'm showing you several weeks later, Apple's trading at 192. Now we do care. We do care that Apple's now trading at 192. And your customer closes out for intrinsic value. Your customer closes out for intrinsic value. So I said, be careful. I'm not asking you what's the intrinsic value. The intrinsic value is 12. I'm asking you, what is the gain or loss if he closes it out at intrinsic value? That so would now, be cool. There we go. So now we're going to put 12 in there, right? Yeah. Is he happy or is he sad? Happy or sad? He's happy. He's happy, right? He made some money. He's got more money in than what? Money out. Now, by the way, ladies, you could also memorize the break even. 
I know the break even is 188. The stock's 192. And that's four points in the right direction. Right? Yeah, that's so, what I did. Yeah, that's fine. So, that's fine. That's fine. Now, where that might let you down is when stuff gets a little more complicated or you got more than one thing going on, but that would work. So now, does the government want some of that money from you? Yeah. They do, right? They want some of that money. So you've got a taxable gain here. And we said all options trading is short term. So you have a four point or $400 short term gain, right? So all that, when they're asking you tax consequences of an option that got traded, I'm gonna show you now the option expiring. I'm gonna show you the option getting exercised. But we said there's only three things that can happen to this option contract. It can be traded, it can expire, or it can be exercised. P.S. that's how every question is gonna end. The question is gonna end with the contract got traded, the contract got exercised, or the contract what? expired and then remember you told me i said is that good news or bad news and you were correct to say well it depends it depends right all right let's try a, a different price so let's go back here we'll just reset the initial setup doesn't change right that's the initial setup and courtney said the break even is 188 she is bullish so she said the 188 or higher i'm going to be a winner less than 188 i'm going to be a loser right so she was correct uh, let's uh, do uh, this. Your customer buys one Apple December 180 call at eight. When Apple's trading at 178. Do we care about that? 170 what? 178. Do we care where Apple's at when we do the trade? It's out of the money. We it's care about money. where it's so. when we close the trade, right? Mm -hmm. We don't care oh. about where the stock is when we do it. We care where it's at later on. Okay. Right? So your customer buys one Apple December 180, call it eight, when Apple's 178. At expiration, Apple remains unchanged. Apple remains unchanged. And that means Apple is still what? 180. 180. 178. Oh, shit. That's all right. Let's do it again. Your okay. customer buys one Apple December 180, call it at eight. When Apple's trading at 178. At expiration, Apple remains unchanged. Okay. So, still trading so now what happens to the 180 call at expiration? If the Apple is 180 or lower, what's going to happen to that contract? It's going to expire worthless. Yeah. Right on, right? That's exactly what's going to happen. Now, uh, I'm under no obligation to tell you that. Now, Courtney, you got to be a little careful. And what I mean by I'm telling Courtney, she's got to be a little careful because if she's comparing 178 to her break, even at 188, she's going to tell me that uh, this person lost 10 points and she's going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. right? Because you can only lose your initial investment. So it is important when memorizing break even to realize there's a floor there. There's a floor at 180. Okay, so now once again, now we're going to say, okay, are we happy or are we sad? So you bought an Apple, December 180, call it eight. When Apple was 178, it remains unchanged. Didn't matter, by the way, 178, 179, 177, 180 or lower, it doesn't matter. And the contract expires. Uh, happy or sad? Sad. Sad. Now, good news, you may need a loss this year. Okay. okay. You may need a loss Happy. this year. Well, maybe, Carol. <laughs> you needed a loss. That's a good attitude, though. I always like it when customers have that attitude when they lose money. You know, <laughs> customer one time he, he lost it. He, he was doing options. He lost 120 grand. And he, no, good news, he an heir to a drugstore chain. But, you know, he, he said, well, Danny, I could use the loss this year. And I said, man, Mark, I wish I lived in your world. In my world, that, that would be a problem. <laughs> you know. So, you know. Um, oh, Dean, I have a question just yeah. to read. Well, hold on. Let me just finish up and I'll take your question. Okay. So uh, that's going to be an $800 short-term capital loss, right? All okay. options trading, all options trading is short-term. So what you're going to do is you're going to net up your short-term gains and losses. So I've shown you this so far. I've shown you this being traded and the tax consequences of that. 
you know, if we close it out like like six, we, we would uh, have a $200 loss. I haven't shown you exercise yet. When I answer, is it Maria that has the question? When I answer that question, what I'm going to show you next is us exercising this contract and show you what that looks like in terms of tax consequences. Okay, uh, what was the question? Oh, I just wanted to confirm because I feel like that was a whole lot of words. Mm -hmm. um, if our strike price is 180, a break point is 188. Yep. Oh, the hold stock on. was slow. Oh, we'll slow, slow down. So let's just boom and let's put that in there. And what was your next thing? You wanted to confirm. It's a 180 call. I'm confirming that. Mm -hmm. 180. Our break point is 188. Let's put that there. Let's well, slow down. Let's, we got you know, you guys paid for two hours, so we got plenty of time. Uh, we have plenty of opening things on the list, so. purchase. <laughs> you did an opening purchase, right? You went long, a tutoring session. So that is our break even indeed. Okay, so what's next, Maria? And then, but the stock sold at 178. Yeah, well, we didn't sell the stock. We just said the stock's at 178. And that's why I was just saying, yeah, but look careful because I don't know if I should tell you mistakes that people make, but you know, what a lot of people who memorize break-evens do, there's nothing wrong with memorizing break-evens, but they will compare their break-even and say that's 10 points in the wrong direction and tell me it's a $1,000 loss that would be offered to you and it would be wrong. And what well, I was what suggesting I was to you is you need to know there's a floor here. Let me just put it in there. Options in my world, not testable, but all about floors and ceilings. And so here there's a floor at 180. Right. No so ceiling. what I was going to say next was, so since our strike price is 180, our break point is 188, mm -hmm. and the stock is currently trading at 178, anything below 180 is going to be a loss. So it really doesn't matter the number. That's right. right. That's exactly right. I could pay 160, 150, it doesn't matter. So now, I that's not like a bad thing, Maria, but it's a good thing, right? It's one of the good things is that the floor is 180. If you bought the Apple of stock, the floor would be zero. You would, you know, participate in losses all the way to zero. But here, worst case is, again, we're, we're talking about tax consequences, but, you know, the worst case here is you're going to lose $800. So pretty easy to, to determine suitability here. Is right, this because it's a buy. you can afford to lose? You know? yep. And because it's a buy and it's because of call. Like That's the reason yep. why I don't have to worry. Yeah, when you I buy know it. anything below that 180 line is going right. to be a that's loss. Right. That's right. It's like buying a lottery ticket, right? You bought a lottery ticket for $800. So what happens, worst case? You know, you don't win and then you lose your money, right? Okay, so now let's uh, reset. Let's reset. Okay, so we're looking at, we're talking about tax consequences of options. We're talking about tax consequences of options. And for the most part, they're asking you, you know, they just do the, you know, profit or loss and then tell me whether it's a short-term gain or not. Oh, but, but here we go. So your customer buys one Apple, December 180, call at eight. When Apple's at 178. At expiration, at expiration, Apple is 192. Now, remember in the previous version of this question, in the previous version of this question, I said several weeks later. Please note, in this version of the question, I didn't say several weeks later. I said at expiration. So remember, this is when we're playing musical chairs, and this is when the music stops, right? And so my question to you is, if your customer has an Apple, December 180, call it eight, and at expiration, Apple is 192, what's going to happen to that option contract? It's going to get Yeah, we're going to exercise it for him. I mean, why would he not want us to do that? I mean... You know, he's in his car, go, oh my God, I forgot to call Dean and tell him to exercise my 180 call. I go, no worries. You know, in your option agreement, we told you that if there was intrinsic value, we're going to go ahead and do what for you? Exercise on the yeah, first Friday. Yeah, I mean, why would you not want me to do that? I mean, if you call me up and you're you're mad at me, I go, listen, I don't know, I don't know why you're upset with me. <laughs> why would you not want to exercise this contract? We told you that if, if this was the case, we were going to do that. Right. So now the contract gets uh, exercised. 
And now the test question is, what is my cost basis in Apple? What is my cost basis in Apple? Because what we need to be able to do is compare the cost basis. Wouldn't it be the 180, 188? That's right. And for the most part, for the most wider. part, it's for the it. most part, break the cost basis follows break even. For the most part, I'm going to show you an exception to that. So that's our cost basis. And so what I'm telling you, ladies, is on the test, whenever they ask you cost basis, I would just translate to break even. And 99 okay. out of 100 times, you're going to be correct. There's a, a couple times when you won't be correct. But for the most part, if you just do the break even, when you hear the word cost basis, you're going to be correct. Right? So what if there's we're a talking... stock added to it? Well, I'm going to... Like if it's a hedge... Well, yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about Carol, right? Okay, now. We're sorry. About you know, so I'm gonna show you when it's not the case. But for the most part, cost basis follows break even. So uh, here our cost basis 188. And then they say uh, several months later, or several weeks later, or a year later, whatever the case may be, you sell the stock. Now we have to be a little careful, right? Because now we need to know whether it's going to be a long-term or short-term gain, right? We know that all options, all options are short-term, but stocks are a little different. Other investments are a little different. Remember, if you've held an investment, you've been at risk in an investment for how long does it become a long-term capital gain? One year. Yeah, more, more than 12 months, right? So we just got to be careful now. They say you sell the stock, you sell the stock at 192. And so uh, now that's going to be a four point gain. A four point, it's still a four point gain. It was a four point gain last time I showed it to you. And it's still a four point gain here when we exercise. But this uh, four point is short term because we didn't hold the stock for more than 12 months. So if I would have said uh, 13 months later, we sell it for 192, then that would be a long-term capital gain, right? So if we have a stock position, then we just have to see, okay, how long do we hold it to determine? So here, the sales proceeds, it could either be long-term or short-term, depending on what we've done, how long we've had. So it could be either. Okay, so we have looked at we have looked at this position from every standpoint of what could have happened. We said there's only three things that can happen. Let's just be clear here. I'm not asking what can happen to an investor. We're asking what can happen to a 180 call. That call can be traded. That call can be exercised that call could expire expire we said if at expiration of the contract the 180 call has intrinsic value it will be exercised mm -hmm. and we said if at expiration the contract has no intrinsic value it will expire worthless worthless so we've talked about that tax consequences of that now you brought up uh hedges you brought mm -hmm. up hedges so let's look at a hedge. You look at a popular hedge to test you on. So a hedge is a, a fence, right? And a hedge keeps good things in and bad things out, right? I told you I built my new cabin, but I had a mountain place and I had a fence. And at the gate, it says a Rottweiler lives here. You know, his name is Yogi. He keeps good things in and bad things what? Out. You know, mom is retired and, uh, you know, I take care of mom. She lives with me. But in those days, you know, I had a, an apartment in San Francisco and mom was in the mountain place. And sometimes she's there a week by herself. And she goes, you think I'm safe? I go, and there's a lot of softer targets in the neighborhood. I'm not so sure somebody wants to mess with Yogi. You know, and, you know, people pull up the driveway. He'd go nuts. And these people in the pickup, he goes, man, your dog is upset. I goes, yeah, he doesn't like people sneaking up on him. You know, in the country, you're supposed to honk your horn, announce your presence, let people know you're rolling up on somebody's driveway. Anyways, you know, he knows his job. 
So hedging is all about what if I'm wrong? So let's say I buy 100 shares of Apple at 178. And I say, hey, listen, are we interested in hedging this position? Are we interested in hedging this position? Now, there's two things that we can do in terms of this stock position. This is not an option position. This is a stock position. And the two things we can do, and I'm going to show you, Carol, the tax consequences of those two things. We can decide to generate additional income. I say, hey, Carol, how would you like to agree to sell Apple high that you just bought low? <clears throat> Somebody, Carol, will pay you several hundred dollars to agree to sell Apple 185 that you bought at 178. You know, that'll lower your out-of-pocket cost on the stock, give you some price decline protection. There's a potential three sources of profit, Carol. The difference between 178 and 185. The uh, premium of several hundred dollars is yours to keep, and Apple pays dividends, and those are yours to keep. So I'm going to show you a covered call and the tax consequences of that. Or I say, hey, Carol, you know, Apple's pretty volatile, and maybe you want to want to buy some term insurance on this stock position. You know, you buy insurance. You don't buy insurance because you plan on wrecking, right? You buy insurance in case something bad what? Yeah, happens, you know? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an old guy anymore, you know? I'm willing to admit I'm an old guy. And I got a little fender bender with this young man, and I got out of his car, and I, I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. I said, great. You know, it's just a car, and then it can be replaced, and good news, I'm properly insured. So you're going to have no problem. You know, we're going to get your car fixed, and we'll get back to doing what we need to be doing. All right, so I'm going to show you buying a put. I'm going to show you the tax consequences of that. Now, here we got to be a little careful. Now, I'm kind of teaching here, which I don't like, to test prep vendors rather than the actual test. And what I mean by that is on your test prep materials, they will test you and practice questions about what is the difference between buying the put out of the gate right now versus buying the put several weeks later. Right, so I'm going to buy protection. I can either buy the protection now, which I'm going to, or I can add the protection later. And I'll talk about both of those. Okay, so. They're talking about from when you purchased the stock? I purchased the protection. Oh. I already purchased the stock, and now I'm going to purchase the protection. So I'm That's buying it out of the gate means to buy it when you bought Simultaneously. The stock? Yeah, okay, right. okay. Simultaneously. Right, so now I'm going to buy one... Apple. Now I got to decide how long I want the protection in place. The longer I want the protection in place, the more it's going to cost me. You know, protection costs money, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe I go out to uh, December. And now I got to decide where do I want to put in the floor? At what price do I want to be able to sell the Apple? A choice to sell at a higher price will give me greater protection but it will also cost me more money. Higher strike put contracts always have greater premiums, right? So maybe I go for the 175 puts and boom. And let's say that protection is gonna cost me four points. Okay, so we're not actually doing uh, break-evens and all that stuff, but we can certainly talk about that. Uh, but we're talking about tax consequences. But whether we're talking about tax consequences or not, you know, I always tell you that what I think you should do, particularly on puts, is just kind of look at what you're do looking at here. You're looking at a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. And the other thing you got to be real careful about here is I can't tell you how many people forget this as a stock position. I'll say, oh, Dean, my break even's 171. Uh, my max loss is $400. I'm a bear. And, uh, you know, I want to go to zero so I can make $171. And this is not an option position. This is a stock position. You can't let the option tail wag the stock dock. And so whenever you see the stock, you got to say, okay, well, well, I got to stay focused on the stock here. 
And so this is a bullish person. This person is bullish because, you know, they have the stock. They wouldn't own that stock unless they thought the stock was going up. Now, remember, hedging is about what if you're right. Hedging is about what if you're wrong, right? And if you're wrong, the apple doesn't go up. The apple goes yeah. If you're wrong. Yeah, that's so what you're trying to do, remember, is say, okay, mm -hmm. well, it goes down. Do I have some protection? Do I have some protection? Now, we're talking about taxes. And do you remember what I told you for the most part about uh, uh, cost basis? I said for the most It'll part. Be or break if, even. Yeah. So let's just try it. Let's uh, make our T and point. let's get our break even. This is the one time and the one time only that we have a put and we're actually adding to get the break even because this is not a put position. And so our break even and our cost basis is going to be 182. That is our cost basis. And again, that follows our break even. So now if later on we sell the stock, we're either going to have a gain or a loss. So that's both the break even. As I said, for the most part, break even follows cost basis for the most part. So if you do hear the word uh, on the test, cost basis, and you just do break even about 99% of the time, you're going to be correct. And the way I got that break even was I took the stock cost plus the premium. As we said, this is the one time and the one time only that you're going to uh, have a put and you're not subtracting. Now, the reason you're not subtracting is because, again, this is not a uh, option position. So anything that's a um, money out of your pocket would be considered a cost basis, and anything that's money in your pocket would be considered a sales proceeds. Am I thinking well, of that right? Well, assuming on what direction you do it, remember. What I mean by that is, yes, assuming you're going long, and then you sell, right? Because that's what you do. You turn your money into the investment, right? That's your cost basis. And then so later on, you're going to turn the investment back into money. Okay. That's, and, they, and that's... Well, you owe the taxes, right? All right. So that was the uh, one of the hedges that, Carol, you asked me about. And this is the only one that doesn't follow what I've said. And I'm not so sure we should spend so much time on the exceptions. <laughs> Let's say, uh, you know, this is the one time that's not going to be true. Well, Kaplan tests me all the time on the exceptions. And I'm yeah, just, you know, if it's, I, it's, but if it's Kaplan's deal, then I'm not. Well, they, I'm perfect fine. Does it. Yeah, it, it, Past Perfect does it too. So, you know, oh my God. I actually think Past Perfect does it more, more worse than than Kaplan. Uh, you know, uh, you guys are probably, you ladies probably know Brian and Lee and I are pretty good friends. And uh, we went out gambling and drinking last night. And, you know, some days we, we talk about how, how old we are. And we're, if we were younger men, we would take on Past Perfect and Kaplan and training consultants. And we'd set up a prep company and we'd take on the world. And then we, Cheers and go, ah, nah. <laughs> you know, our, our ride is almost over. You know? So that's a younger men and women to do than, than us. But, uh, you know. I have a quick question. Yeah. So when, as far as the numbers, a lot of um, these programs do solid numbers, but there's one of them that likes to do decimals. Are the... No, no, no. Is no, the no. exam going to be like 32.5 no, no. and... I no, like no, annoying. no. They're, you know, they, they yeah, you, you might have to deal with like 2.5. Uh, you might have to turn eights and 30 seconds into dollar dollar amounts. No, I mean on options. No, no. And it, it drives me nuts, by the way, even Kaplan. Nobody wants to kill questions and they don't, like I have an old exam on my channel and, and I, everybody falls for this. Nobody wants to kill a question because everyone wants to brag about how many questions they have. And so even Maria Kaplan, there are fractions and there are no fractions. Options haven't traded in fractions and like, you know, 20 years. And so are they going to be super large numbers as yeah, well? No, no. To, well, even if they're super large numbers, what I would say is, Maria, my warning or heads up to you is to do it on a per share basis, right? And then when you're all done, multiply it once by however many shares that is, right? So what I'm saying is I'm going to show you this one. It wouldn't matter. Dean would do the exact same thing I'm about to do with you right now if that was 10,000 shares of Apple and 1,000 contracts. I would do it without the zeros, you know. Right. By the way, break even is a per share number, anyways. 
Okay, so, so I had now a we're going to. That was like twenty five hundred. Like the stock was selling at twenty five. Yeah, well, like you, know, you ladies have been pretty good. At, I don't know which lady because you know the phone numbers are where it's showing up. But uh, sending those to me, just send me when you send it. See it, just screenshot it and send we it. We really to appreciate say, that. Worry about it, or I'll tell you not to worry about it, or you know whatever the case may be. Right. All right. Give right. Dean's number, Maria. You can yeah. send him all your questions. Yeah. <laughs> we want to see them too. Now he's going to throw us out. He's gonna <laughs> Well, I told Brian, I said, hey, I got this lady syndicate going on or they're, they're sharing the tutoring and because I don't do that. And I'm like, well, I said, yeah, well, I know he said he told me that I was like, yeah. well, I kind of get it. I guess he has a life, you know, Stacy, and she probably would be upset with him if he said he was spending time with other ladies on the uh, weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first kind of a trick, don't be looking for tricks. Don't be looking for tricks. But remember, we can only write one contract here. Right. If we write two contracts, there's no such thing as being partially naked. Right. So just, you know, don't be looking for it, but, you know, got to be careful. So I'm going to write one Apple. Now we got to decide how long are we willing to give up the stock? I say, as I told you, Carol, people will pay us hundreds of dollars in advance to do what we're about to do. What we're about to do is agree to sell high stock. We just bought low and we can also get more premium if we agree to a longer term option contract, because longer term option contracts always have greater premiums. So maybe we go out to February, just, you know, to get paid a little more money. So we're going to write one Apple February. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to pay attention to here. I am into this drawing for a uh, winner for, they were doing channel reviews and uh, they did my channel and I got to advance to the, the stage where they pull the number and you win, you get, uh, the stupid thing. It's a, either a duck or a coffee cup or whatever it happens to be. But anyways, uh, February. Now, this is a disadvantage. I said options are about floors and ceilings. And we're actually putting in here a ceiling. So what I mean by that, Carol, is the more bullish we are, the higher the strike we're going to write. The less bullish we are, the lower the strike we're going to write. So because we're agreeing to give up the stock. And so we're going to get ready to give up the Apple stock at 185. And for that, somebody is going to give us some money. Uh, by the way, the disadvantage, by the way, just one more point here, right? Is if we will agree to sell at a lower price, we'll get more money. We'll get more money for a 185 call than a 190. Because remember, lower strike call contracts always have greater Premium. premiums, right? The way I say that is lower, higher, longer. Lower, higher, longer. Lower, higher, longer. Lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. Higher strike puts always have greater premiums. And longer term option contracts always have greater premiums. And let's say for this, we get uh, $900. So again, uh, what I would do first is I always like to, underneath the option contract, put down what is the contract specification. And the contract specification here is an obligation to sell the stock at the strike price. And again, I don't know if I should show you common mistakes, but one common mistake. Oh, Dean, it's a naked call. It's 194 and it's, uh, you know, bearish. And, you know, I, I can make nine and lose unlimited sums of money. Eh. This is not a naked call. This is not a naked or uncovered call. This is a cover call. And again, the key to this, ladies, is remember that whenever you have the stock, that's what dominates. So it doesn't matter what option position we add to that. That's a stock position. And if you buy 100 shares of stock, are you a bull or are you a bear if you buy 100 shares of stock? Bull. Right? So this is a bullish position. And, you know, that's kind of important because you got to stay focused on the stock. You know, be focused on the tail. Don't let the tail option wag the dog, the stock, right? So okay, since, so now, we're, since we're selling, since we're writing, then that means that we're going to subtract it to two. So our break. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to do now our setup. We're going to do our setup. And this is a courtesy of Carol. 
This is the one one that's funky. This one is funky. This is the, the only one I can think of where cost basis does not follow break even. So we're out 178 for the stock. We brought in for the option nine points. So our break even here, and Dean said for the most part, cost basis follows break even. And the break even here is 169. But that is not the case in a covered call. In a covered call, this is our cost basis, 178. So this is the funky one. This is the only one that's kind of like that. And so now let's say that this contract gets exercised. And remember, that means when I tell you the contract got exercised, you should know that means that she had to give up the stock, right? She got called away and she got called away at the strike price, 185. You don't participate past the strike price. And so this is the one that's funky here. And what I mean by being funky is the cost base in the covered call. The cost base in the covered call is 178. So writing the call doesn't affect the cost basis on the stock. So we're just gonna put that there. And here, this is 185. And boom, now let's put that there. And as I said, this is the one time that this does not follow break even. So this is gonna be your cost basis and a covered call, what you paid for the stock. And this is going to be your sales proceeds. And your sales, now again, remember somebody was asking Maria about, is Dean gonna put $17,800 there or no? Am I going to put 18.5 there? No. If it was 10 contracts, I'd put $178,000 there. No. What I'm going to do it is per share. And then when I'm all done, just say, okay, well, we're talking about X number of shares here. And this is the sales proceeds. Right. And so that is actually the one time and the one time only. Oh, it looks like I didn't do my arithmetic correctly. Uh, my arithmetic there is uh, 194, excuse me. Right. So why? Why what? Why is this the exception? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. They'd talk to the IRS, you know, not probably to mess up series seven test takers. I don't know. Okay. That's what <laughs> I was. I had the same question. Like, I just don't understand why. Well, okay. Yeah. That's a great answer. Thank well, you. Well, the tax, the tax code is what the tax code is. I mean, uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of accountants somewhere who met. <laughs> there is, there is, I'm teasing, but there's a, what's called the federal accounting standards board and accountants who decide how things should be done and you know then and the irs tells you i i usually answer and let's see if it will hold true here uh i usually say that you should guess what yields the most of the u.s treasury and here i'm not so sure this would yield more or less to the treasury so how this, am i supposed to recognize that this would be an exception like it looks you like should a normal question well, let's be very clear maria you should definitely know this is a covered call right it's only covered calls so if you recognized a covered call then you would know that this is the one done it's very testable. I identify the strategy. So you so should covered, tell me that you're looking at a covered call. And you should be able to tell me that is a covered call. You're so probably going to get calls. four or five covered call questions on the seven. Even if it wasn't a test question to identify it, I just told you it is. But even if it wasn't, I just told you it is. If you can't identify the option strategy, you're stuck. You're dead in the water. You're going to say, I don't know. I guess B, I guess. Right. So you got to identify it as a straddle. Is it a spread? Is it a covered call? Is it a protective put? Now, Maria, uh, the good news is there's only nine option strategies you're held accountable for. Only. only nine. This is one of the nine called the covered call. You're held accountable for long call, short call, long put, short put. Those are the four basics. You're held accountable for two advanced option strategies, spreads and straddles. And then you're held accountable for what we just talking about, a covered call and a protective put. And then the uh, last one you're held accountable for is how to effectively hedge a short stock position. And that would be buying a call. So those are the nine. So there's nine strategies you're held accountable for on Series 7. And again, identification is important. 
So you know, I'm recognizing gonna... I'm recognizing that it is a covered call because we're buying 100 shares and we're writing one. That's right. Sometimes the other name for this testable is a buy right. So covered calls are also known as buy rights because you're buying the stock and you're writing the option. Oh, okay. So on a covered call, the cost basis will be the number. Yeah, whatever you pay for the shares. That's okay. right. That's right. Got it. Okay. Thank so that you. Was that was the one. So, helps. all right. So that's our first thing that was in our thing, taxes on options. So uh, again, um, I think the vendors go a little more into this than uh, other things do. But as a reminder, I said, the thing you want to remember is that trading options is short term. All you got to do is figure out the gain or loss and tell me it's a short term gain or loss, depending on profit or loss. So we said you could just literally compare it to your break even pretty straightforward. We said the option expires pretty straightforward. It's a short-term gain or loss. If you bought the option expires worthless, it's a short-term loss. If you sold it, it's a short-term gain. We said the only thing that gets tricky is if the contract gets exercised. And then we said if the contract gets exercised, your cost basis follows the break-even. The cost basis follows the break-even. And then Carol said, well, what about hedges? I said, well, let's talk about that. And again, for the most part, even in the hedges, cost basis follows break even. I showed you where we bought the stock and we bought a put. The only time the cost basis doesn't follow break even is in a covered covered put. Covered, covered call. call. Oh, sorry. A covered right. That's right. That's right. Covered call. <laughs> Bye, right. <laughs> oh, right. Maria. Right on. I'm right. looking at it wrong. I had it in my head right now. Like, no hey. worries. No worries. No worries. Okay. So the next thing on our list is ETFs and ETNs. Mm. Okay. So 